So I am going to turn it over to Mike Berg. And, oh, see this red thing? Listen closely about how it is attached to his presentation. <laughs> you'll be absolutely amazed. And maybe we can auction this off at the end. <laughs> but don't tell them the secret until okay. the very end. All right. So I'm setting it here. Hopefully I didn't leave my fingerprints on it. But uh, just think of death and dying and look at that bright red. And maybe you'll be able to figure it out before the end. Okay, Mike. All right. It's all yours. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. I, I just want to know how much uh, you paid all these people to show up. <laughs> you have to pay them on the way out. Oh, okay. All right. Well, between family, friends, and uh, classmates, I got a pretty good, uh, pretty good crowd going here. But uh, well, like Roger says, my name is Mike Berg. I'm a Wadsworth native, uh, Wadsworth High School, class of '72, and there's a couple of my classmates here tonight. And uh, I. Uh, I worked for the uh, Ripman Police Department for 39 years and uh, retired as chief. And during that time, I also picked up a side job with Gilman Funeral Home. And that kind of got me in that direction and uh, started getting a little interested in, in death investigation and so forth. And I started reading a lot of true crime books. I, I like to read true crime books. Any, any true crime buffs here? People like to read that? Yeah. And I read them because I wanted to know how the crimes were solved. That's what, that's what got me curious about them. Um, so I was ca able to take a couple of uh, death investigation courses at the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy. And uh, I got those under my belt. And um, I did that because Ripman PD, because we were small, we still are, they still are small, is not fortunate enough to have their own detective bureau. And I think that's a good thing and it's a bad thing, really. Um, it's a good thing because when an officer goes to a scene for something, that officer takes that report and follows that case all the way through prosecution. Uh, in, in other departments, bigger departments, the officer goes to the scene, takes the initial report, turns it over to the detective bureau, and basically has nothing else to do about it. So I think, you know, I can see both aspects of it. I mean, yeah, you have a detective bureau that just does that, and they're really good at it, and it frees the officer up for patrol and answering other calls. And on the other hand, you get a, a more well-rounded officer because that officer has to do the whole thing from start to finish. So, you know, there's pros and cons. Um, after I took those courses, I was very fortunate. Uh, those of you who, who like reading true crime will probably recognize the names. Uh, there's the big three in forensic science. It's um, uh, Dr. Michael Bodden, Dr. Cyril Wecht, and Dr. Henry Lee. I was fortunate enough to get to uh, attend courses on two of those. Whoop. I'm going the wrong way. That's me and Dr. Michael Bodden. <laughs> and me and Dr. Cyril Wett. And uh, that, was, that really put it over the top. So I, I got really hooked listening to them. And then uh, anybody familiar with, with the TV show uh, Criminal Minds? Yeah, I, that's a pretty popular show. After I made Sergeant, I was fortunate enough to be selected to go to the FBI National Academy in Quantico where the Behavioral Science Unit is uh, stationed at. And uh, while I was there, of course, the, the three big names in behavioral science were John Douglas, who pretty much started the Behavioral Science Unit, and his associate Roy Hazelwood and uh, Robert Ressler. Uh, and that's Robert Ressler. I was able to have one of his classes while I was down there. So I really got, got into this, but um, Roy, Roy was with the uh, FBI for 22 years and 16 of them were with behavioral science. So how this book all began, I, got, I, don't, know, I don't see him here. I was hoping he's going to be here because I always blame him. And I will again tonight, so it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> 
That's Chief Dave Singleton from Wadsworth Police Department. He's the person to blame for this book. <laughs> In uh, 2009, uh, Dave knew that I was also a big police history buff, and City Hall was uh, doing a, a major uh, records purge. And they came, he came across an old black and white 8 by 10 picture, and there was nothing written on it. No one knew what it was or anything. So he asked me if I could stop by and take a look at it and see if I knew what it was. And I didn't. Uh, it looked very much like a fatal traffic crash is what it looked like to me. And we discussed it a little bit, and we didn't know. However, because I also wrote the history of Watts with PD, I did recognize one of the officers in the picture, and it was Bernie Ty. Well, Bernie was still alive at that time. So I asked Dave for a copy. He photocopied the picture, and I went to, to Bernie. And I asked him, so what is this? And he told me. He goes, oh, that's not a fatal crash. He goes, that's a, that's a murder-suicide. And I'm like, hmm. So I, I told Dave. And uh, then I got to thinking, well, if that one was almost lost to history, how many have we lost to history? How many that we don't know that just aren't documented? So I got messing around, fooling around, looking, looking at my uh, uh, different things. And so I started to research this more uh, out of personal curiosity than anything else. Uh, at that point, a book really wasn't in mind, just to document the, the homicides and, and deaths of suspicious nature in Wadsworth. Um, the research was important to me uh, to be as historically accurate as possible. And that's why there are, if you have the book, that's why there are unverified, there are four unverified uh, stories in it. Because I had enough information for me to believe that something happened, but I didn't have enough to really make me believe, and I couldn't find anything, that, that there was a homicide involved. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, a little bit later. Um, I also strive, one of the things that I really wanted to do when I decided to put it into a book was for each story to have an ending. There is nothing worse than a story that you're reading and you're building up and then nothing. You don't have anything. There's no ending to it. And I hate that. So I really did my best to, uh, to get an ending for each one of them. It wasn't possible in, all, in, in every case. There were a couple uh, stories in the book that have no ending because I just I couldn't find them. Uh, and I also wanted to, uh, for true crime buffs, I also wanted to put a map and a picture, if I could, with the story. So if, if they wanted to know where it took place in town, and if the location was still available, I took a photo of it and, and put it with the, with the story so people could, could see where, where it took place and what part of town and so forth. Um, my two favorite research, resource sources that, uh, that I took, uh, spent a lot of time in Naturally, the, the, histor the Historical Society's research room, I think that's the best kept secret in town. Uh, there's a lot of information in there, and, uh, and I spent a considerable amount of time there. But not as much time as I did right around the corner here at the local history room right here in, in this building. And that's because they had all the old Enterprise and, and news banners on microfish and you could sit there and look at them. The one saving thing for me was that homicides and deaths of suspicious nature are usually front page uh, news, so you only had to kind of look at the front pages, but there's a lot of front pages over there, believe me. So putting it all together, uh, every writer has their own style, and I'm no different, but this one was a little weird. Um, I wanted to keep the stories in chronological order, but it was kind of difficult because I'd be over here looking at something and I'd find an article I'm looking for and I go to print it out and I go to the next page and gee, there's another one that I never heard, another homicide or another death of suspicious nature. So I'd print that out. So I decided I'd get a binder and I'd put tabs in it. And that way I could keep the articles 
in chronological order, or the, the information, the research, in chronological order, and the stories in order as well. And that went on for a while. And I did that until I could find no more uh, information on any of them. And in the end, that's my binder. That's a big sandwich. And, and I didn't know they made binders that big. <laughs> but uh, that's, where it, uh, that's where it wound up. Um, and all the, I have all the, the, the tabs in here with the names of all the victims. And that's another thing that I did, I tried to do in the book, is put the pictures of all the victims in the book. And there's no pictures of any of the perpetrators. Because I didn't want to give them any, I mean, I, obviously I named them in the story, but I didn't want to give them any more. Uh, notoriety. No, yes, thank you, notoriety than, than they needed here. Uh, so, so that was all together. And I sat down to write it, and uh, I went through one, one chapter at a time and wrote it one, one chapter at a time. Um, the book tells the stories of 43 deaths and, and uh, four unverifieds and includes a brief synopsis of 14 homicides in, in Rittman. Uh, researching the older stories, I found that to be both educational and very frustrating. Um, educational because the newspapers wrote things a lot differently back then than they do now. Uh, for example, in, in the story of Frank Humbert in 1921, there was a, he died in a fire. And there was a term in there called set the stove. He failed to set the stove. I had no idea. So naturally, my first call was to Dr. Carino and said, what does set the stove mean? And he informed me what set the stove meant and that it very well could have caused a fire. Uh, in the, uh, the homicide of Black Darmot in 1928, uh, they used the phrase canned heat. Well, I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, and to me, Canned Heat's a rock group that played at Woodstock. Okay? I had no idea what, what Canned Heat was, and basically what it is, it's, it's like a super moonshine, is what it is. And, and that, they, they were partaking of that at the time of his death. And, um, at Woodstock or at? Um, <laughs> at the Brickyard. <laughs> And probably at Woodstock, too, yeah. Um, the frustrating part came when I'm, I'm looking and reading the articles on all these older homicides, and, I'm, th and you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, why didn't they just do this, or why didn't they just do that, or, or DNA? And it's like, well, they didn't have it. It wasn't, it wasn't available to them. So, and, and so I'm thinking, you know, a lot of these cases could have been solved had they happened today. Had, if they had the technology back then that we have today, they could have been solved. So that's kind of sad. Um, and the reporting at the time, that was kind of, uh, <laughs> especially when I was doing the, the chapters on the Italian wars, I think that the reporters, I'm not picking on any reporters if they're here, but I think the reporters at the time, they heard a name and they wrote it the way it sounded. Um, Yeah, sorry. As you can see, the when we're, when you're dealing with those, 
it was kind of hard to uh, I have one of the uh, newspaper articles that uses those four spellings in the same article and I think it's the same guy but I don't I think I don't know if I'm dealing with one person or four and I don't even know how to spell it uh, pronounce his name dr. Karina how do you pronounce that <laughs> same and then when Charles and John Lenzo, the brothers were killed, they were listed as Lenzo, Lanzo, or Lonzo. So it, that was the, the, uh, one of the frustrating parts, but uh, we managed to, and that is the, uh, the house that uh, the wise with black hand probably uh, was uh, working out of at the time. So, So later on, the book caught the attention of Ohio Mysteries, which is a podcast out of Akron. And the woman who runs it is a former um, Beacon Journal reporter. And she interviewed me on, I, I think I chose, uh, I chose the story of Benny Mosteller in 1973, who burned alive in, uh, in a cold furnace up here at the uh, foundry. So. Yeah, that's why it's suspicious nature. Yeah. Not too many people burn alive in a cold furnace, but he did. Um, since 2019, when the book came out, there have been some changes. Uh, I've had to add another homicide, Iran Cannon from the North End in 2020. Um, and I need to remove unverified number one. Uh, that was the, the Wise, uh, the woman by the name of Wise that uh, we thought was, was uh, killed along the railroad tracks at Silver Creek. Um, however, actually I, I found this researching the book I'm writing now and it kind of, it, uh, again, dealing with Dr. Karina, we, we figured out that uh, this was actually the one that we thought was the wise one and she survived so the unverified was it didn't happen uh, uh, something i did catch my eye after the book came out um, the wise with italian wars was between 1913 and 1920 and I included uh, a double unsolved d death of suspicious nature in Rittman at the end of the book. And that happened in 1917. Both men were Italian immigrants. And I wondered, were they involved uh, somehow in the Wads with Black Hand and silence some way? Uh, we don't know. The, the Wayne County coroner looked that one up for me. She, she went back and dug uh, quite a ways in 1917. And there was no no disposition on, and these two guys just were found dead. So, I don't know. Um, when I'm asked my opinion on on um, the saddest death, it has to be uh, Lily Birkbeck, which is chapter two in uh, 1899. Lily was five years old, and she was poisoned by her stepmother, arsenic. She, she killed her with arsenic. And Lily is buried currently in an unmarked grave down in Woodland. Um, but uh, last month, an email came to Adrian Patrick, uh, the um, director of uh, Main Street Wadsworth. <clears throat> it was from a woman named Lorna in England. And she said that uh, her daughter was getting interested in genealogy and she wanted to help her and, and she, she remembered that her father told her something about one of their relatives that had two families, one in England and one came to Wadsworth, Ohio and there was a skeleton in the closet and his name was uh, Thomas Birkbeck and uh, well, Adrian didn't know, so she did the, the next best thing. She sent the, her Lorna's email to both Dr. Crino and Roger. And uh, Roger picked up on it and noticed that uh, it was the Birkbeck, which was chapter two in my book. So I, uh, I photocopied the chapter and, and all of my material 
uh, on that and uh, emailed it back to her. And uh, it, 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 it turned out really nice. Um, what's going to happen is uh, that woman is in Lorna in England was uh, so moved that her and her daughter are uh, working with Roger and I think friends of the library, or friends of the uh, cemetery. Not um, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, and the, they're going to buy a stone for Lily and, uh, and put, uh, put one up for her so that she's not in an unmarked grave. Now, oddly enough, when Roger found Lily's grave, because unmarked in 1899, he found that she's buried beside Ora Lee, who is a homicide victim nine years after uh, Lily. So the two homicide victims are out there side by side. Um, did I miss any? I don't know. Uh, no one's come forward yet and told me, hey, what about this one or what about that one? Uh, but then again, if you read the book, you know that uh, there are some stories about uh, resurrectionists in town. So there probably were some homicides that happened that went unreported or that we don't know about. Um, and I know that uh, Roger's going to talk here in, in a minute uh, about... Uh, the Historical Society is looking into the possibility of reprinting the book uh, for sale. And it's going to be updated. There are going to be some more pictures. I added several pictures. And uh, the most recent homicide is going to be in it. And unverified number one is going to be uh, gone. Um, That's good. So if you're interested uh, in getting one of those, uh, Roger will tell you about it here in just a minute. Um, so thank, thank you very much for having me tonight. I, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, maybe we'll be Just back out of to curiosity, how many have this book currently, the one he wrote? Okay, not even half the people. How many desire to have this book? <laughs> All right, that's over half. Um, well, well, go ahead. well, why don't you, uh, take questions okay um or explain that slide even though you didn't know i put it in there yeah i don't uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, sylvia aura and that is aura on the right oh it is that's a young picture of her oh, yeah. okay <laughs> sylvia beach over there uh, probably anyone in town knows the story of sylvia beach she was uh, a young girl with um I don't remember the name of the, the medical condition she had, but, uh, well, she but couldn't she, speak. She was, yeah, she, she couldn't speak or hear. I mean, yeah, yeah. speak or hear. And, uh, she actually lived in pretty much in my backyard <laughs> at the time, but, uh, she took off one, uh, spring day and, uh, was never found. She, she, she took off towards, uh, what during, during park areas where they last saw her footprints, I think in the snow. And then the snow melted, and she was never found. Ora Lee uh, was a homicide victim here. She was uh, killed uh, the night before her uh, her wedding, and I had never seen that picture of her before. It's not it's a different one than the one I have in the book. So. Oh, there's things I have that you don't know. Oh, I'm sure of that. <laughs> I'm certain of that. So yeah, so that's her. Those headstones are both located in Woodlawn Cemetery. And uh, obviously, that's an orally younger picture. She was how old when she met her demise? 21. 21. So it was a little prior to that. The other pictures of her out yeah. of the newspaper, and they're yeah. not very clear. And uh, so one of the many murders in her case, what happened to her, or how did she meet her maker? Aura? Yeah. Well, it depends on who you ask. Was she poisoned? No, she was shot. Oh. She was shot. She was shot three times in the head Ooh. from very close range. And guess where you can read about it? <laughs> <laughs> in detail. <laughs> well, there's several places because uh, Linda has uh, two books out on it. Yeah, there's other books yeah. out on just her yeah. murder and the trial. Yep. 
So. All right. Let's right. look for some questions here. I'm sure there's going to be a Lord's plenty. I was wondering, um, I was researching uh, sort of like a story in my own family, and it took me to Indiana. Back in the 1880s, if you're looking for some things, did the sheriff's office keep records as you would find with an attorney's? The best place I found, and, and these women were absolutely wonderful, because the, we're, well, I say we're, I'm still working. Uh, the police department was only required to keep certain records. There's a record retention law in Ohio, and you're only, you're only allowed to keep, or not allowed, but you can keep them for as long as you want. But at certain points, uh, you, can, you can dispose of them. Uh, like, like felonies might be 20 years and misdemeanors might be 10 years or something like that. But they, they do go through and purge them because of the storage space. And so, yeah, but your best bet is common police court because all homicides and, and deaths, like, well, I wouldn't say deaths, but all homicides are, are, would be a felony. And I contacted the uh, archives division of the Medina County uh, Common Police Court and those ladies went downstairs and they dug a lot for me and they found a lot of stuff down there. That's where I got a lot of the answer or the, the final dispositions on a lot of the cases uh, to, to put in the book to say, well, this is how it ended. These people were charged with this and this was what they were sentenced. But yeah, I would try common police court archives. Okay, thank you. Um, have, have you uh, heard of the story of Stanislaus Kazwicki who was an immigrant from Europe that came here and worked at the colony setting pins with me years and years ago. Well, he's the ghost down there, isn't he? He was, well, he, he jumped through a window up on Oak Street to get out of a fire and killed himself. Oh, I didn't know. You know never that. heard of that name? Yeah, I heard of the name, but I thought, I thought uh, it must not be the one I was thinking of, though. I, I wrote an article about him. Okay. He worked at the brickyard for a long time, kind of a... Uh, to himself a lot. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, okay. I've experienced the story if anybody ever wanted to read it. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a, a story that I was chasing several years ago. I uh, put it aside and never really found all the answers. Maybe you might know it. It had one segment of some Wadsworth in it. During Prohibition, I think the uh, bootleggers were from Copley or Akron, yeah. maybe, and um, they got into a tango with the sheriff in Orville, and uh, they wouldn't, uh, I don't know exactly not to intimate, but anyways, the sheriff's daughter, little girl, got murdered, and they never did find, but there is a man in Wadsworth by the name of Hannah, who worked at the movie theater, and for a long time he claimed innocence. He had nothing to do with this person, this little kid getting murdered. But after they, you know, put the sweat on him for a long time, he finally admitted to doing it. Nobody really ever thought, you know, to this very day whether or not he really did it. They just kept pressuring and pressuring. You know anything about that story? I think. Um, it's either I'm, his son or his daughter. I think maybe it's his son. I'm trying to think. Uh, you're not talking about Melvin Horst, are you? Well, it was the sheriff. Melvin Horst was the nephew of the sheriff that lived in Orville, yeah. and he was he came up. He was like three or four years old yeah. and came up missing about two days after Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, but that's uh, there's still it's still an open case in Orville. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Because I think the the guy's last name is Hannah. It's been a couple of years since I started writing all this down, but I think he was um, worked at the Strand Theater or something like oh. that when he found him. So I just often wondered, because I never did find the answer, whether or not, you know, they truly, I don't think they ever found the body. No, they never so did. They who they claim killed him. He technically could still be alive, but he would be in a pretty advanced age by now. Okay. I just wonder if you knew more. Pardon me? Uh, weirdest the weirdest homicide. Hmm. Give me, give me, give me a minute. <laughs> well, Lily's was kind of strange. And yeah. it's 
Which one? Lily. Yeah. Yeah. If you go through the whole. Yeah, Lily. Lily's was was different. She was. They said that she fell out of bed and had a seizure and died. And they buried her. And then rumors were floating around town that no, she was abused, and she was exhumed, and her stomach was sent to Ohio State, and they found some arsenic. So the, the doctor at, uh, uh, at Ohio State says, I want the intestines. So she was exhumed again. And they sent the intestines down. He found even more arsenic. And then, and, and I don't understand this, but from what I found out, the prosecutor took the case to the grand jury uh, on the parents before he got the any reports back from Ohio State. So he didn't have that to present, and the parents were let go. Exonerated. Yeah. And uh, I think they took off after that, which was probably a good idea. So, yes? There was a house on the corner of Garfield and Lincoln, mm -hmm. and it was empty. Yep. And some kids set it on fire, and then they found a, a dead body yep. there. Terry Jenkins, he's in there. Oh, yep. So, okay, anybody else? WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.